And this is all leading into the first chat that we have so far. So welcome to the stage, Tom from Superco and Lisa from Funkin' Cocktails. It's really hot up here, by the way. So just to set expectations, we've got 10 minutes here, so we're not going to suddenly try and cover a million different topics. But we were speaking before this conference about what would be quite relevant to speak to people about. And one of the topics that kind of came over is Funkin's move from Magento over to Shopify. So I guess, Lisa, talk us a little bit in terms of like why you made the move and a little bit how it's gone so far. Oh, yeah. So the reason we changed was, I think, when I went into Funkin, it was quite a lean team. So like any other kind of retailer business, they obviously saw a boom after lockdown and what kind of wanted to prioritize D2C. And when I got in there, there was one person who did the website. He wasn't even, he was a brand manager. And then they were like, here you go, have it. You can go ahead and do whatever you want to it. And I'm not a hugely technical person. Like, I'm not about to change things. And the amount of things, admin, that it took to update things in Magento, to even do at the smallest change was really painful. And it's quite a fast changing market. And I'm sure if you don't know Funkin already, I'm sure you just tasted some now. There's a lot of fun things you can do with that brand. And it's something that we couldn't do fast enough because we were on Magento and we were upgrading servers and doing upgrades in general. So that's what the reason why we decided to move on to Shopify and also because we wanted to integrate the wider team. So really making sure that this, it works from supply chain point of view and a finance point of view as well. Great, and Tom, I guess from your side, so what pitfalls did you encounter and how did you overcome them? I think there's inherently like pitfalls of doing any kind of migration, but going back to the point of moving from Magento to Shopify, like the idea is that Lisa's team have far less pitfalls going forward. So in, in terms of, there was one one pitfall was a certain person, we're not going <laughs> to name, who's subsequently left Funk. It wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't her. No, there's a, yeah. But in general, we worked really well together, I think, as a team. I like to think of, like, as an agency, we've always trying to be an extension of their in-house team, trying to be a, like, Lisa's obviously managing like, all the digital marketing, a lot of the e-commerce stuff, but we as an agency have a lot of experience dealing with other similar brands, other completely different brands. So I like to think we can give a perspective, give some thoughts, some insight that they just don't have the time to really clean themselves. So yeah, I think overall it was a pretty successful project. I think so. I have to say that, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> and how is it going so far? Like, what, how, what's next on the horizon for you guys moving forward within your store? I feel like there's always something to do on the Funky website. Not necessarily just because we are a really weird and kind of complex business where we don't only just target consumers in the retail market, but we also, a lot of our brand heritage is on the on-trade. So restaurants, bars, anything like that. So it's so we've created kind of a trade hub on the Funky store, which will allow bartenders and bar owners and things like that to download assets and get training tools and everything like that. So it's more, it's less of a shoppable store, but more as something that can really allow and nurture our kind of core consumer, which is the on-trade consumer. And they often enough purchase at wholesalers or they purchase directly from Funkin, from, the, from our warehouse. So it's not necessarily all about just saying, okay, here's a product, we want you to buy it, but also really maintaining that relationship with them. And Superco has done a really good job in helping us build that trade hub. And also we are launching into the US yeah, this week. Yeah. We've also, I would say we've done the website, but nearly. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's like, you're not just the kind of a pure play T2C brand. There's, it, what's fascinating about Funkin is, yeah, obviously they've, they have got a big heritage in bars and in, in restaurants and clubs. So yeah, building out that trade hub piece, helping, I mean, using tools like Yotpo, going back to tech stack to like build that kind of a loyalty piece so that people can go in and learn about how to sell Funkin in a bar, how to make a cocktail and earn loyalty points. And with that, get access to like freebies and gifts and kind of more content. And there's the whole piece around like the receipts. Yeah. yeah, so like I said, we have a lot of our kind of bar owners and things like that. They will purchase from a wholesaler, say like Matthew Clark, for example. And we used to have paper vouchers in each box, but obviously we're trying to be, we've 
trying to be as sustainable as we can. So we've now printed QR codes onto the box itself, which takes them to the trade hub. And that way, we, with Yopo, they can scan their receipt and gain points based on their purchase. And with that, in the trade hub, they can then either purchase, I think it's POS items at the moment only, but that means that we get our name behind the brand. So like squeezy bottles, shakers and things like that, which for us is really beneficial because you don't always, I mean, if you see funk in the store, then you know what it is, but you don't always know that it's the prop stuff that's going into your porn star martini, for example. So it's really important for us as a brand to have our name behind the bar as well as in front of it. And the trade hub really allows us to reward our kind of consumers and customers for purchasing us and staying loyal to us, not necessarily only from a DTC point of view, but also from a retail and really building that and bridging that gap between the two. Yeah, and I think Shop Shopify has been very, I mean, I guess easy for us to build out the DC site, to build out the wholesale site for people to buy this stuff and then to build out this trade hub content element as all contained within one Shopify plus store backend. But I think it's, it, you touched on a really good point, which is, and I think for many people in this room will have it as well, is the way in which D 2 C is going now is it's quite often not, there's loads of interesting stats at the moment about how many D 2 C brands are not profitable. I don't know if you guys have seen the stats on LinkedIn, but there's just lists and lists of, all these brands that have IPO'd, none of which are profitable. And I think one of the important things is how it then works with retail. I think it was a really interesting example of how you took this kind of not on site and then brought it back online and like that kind of 360 data collection and how it's really effective in that kind of way. All oh, right, so I guess Tom from your side, anyone, any advice for people wanting to make the move from Magento to Shopify in terms of things they should be thinking about? I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, it, obviously it depends like business to business. We're, we're a Shopify Plus only, we're a Shopify only agency, so obviously we would tout that. But there are other platforms out there, and I recognize that Shopify is not always the platform for absolutely every brand. But I think for most people in this room, it probably is. If you're, yeah, I've D2C focused, it depends on like SKUs, but if you've got a, a core focus around D2C, Shopify is the, kind of the place to be. Yeah, the idea of having to up, do version upgrades and things and make sure your site is hosted is like the stuff of nightmares that I'm quite glad as an agency we don't have to do do at all. So yeah, I mean, like Magento is trickling on, but we do, are, we are seeing a kind of a, a lot of people coming over from there. So yeah, I mean, if anyone's on Magento in this room, I'd be happy to have a chat afterwards. <laughs> And then, yeah, Tom, so what, from your perspective, we obviously heard Adam talking about his perspective on agencies, but from your side, what would you say is what you think you, the value that you as an agency bring compared to, say, for example, an in-house team? Yeah, well, I think like, in this world of, like, recently, a lot of layoffs, obviously a lot of these big kind of top-tier DC brands getting quite bloated, hiring a lot of people, and then realising that they didn't want to make any money, and then having to let a lot of people go. Leaning on an agency is, a, is an efficient way of pulling in expertise, pulling in knowledge that it would be quite hard to learn internally and would require you to hire certain people, big salaries, big overheads, that kind of potential threat to the culture if you then need to lay them off because you can't make the money. Whereas hiring an agency, you can lean into their knowledge, their expertise. You get, it depends obviously which agency and what kind of agency, but you, you do typically will get a kind of a broad array of experience, both like from brand side, working with a ton of brands in a similar sphere, in a completely different sphere. So there's like different perspectives you can get from that. Obviously then like you, there is like an, like an internal learning piece that you may not have as well as if you did build your own internal team, but it allows you to just be so much more lean, it allows you to scale quite rapidly. If you need more resource, you can lean on your agency or find a bigger agency as opposed to like having to hire everyone in house. And then lastly, Lisa, you've got 30 seconds, right? What do you think, uh, from your perspective, is the future of where e-commerce tech is going? I, haven't, I didn't prepare for this, by the way. <laughs> so she see what she comes I was up. like, this was not in the notes. <laughs> That's really hard. You've only given me 15 seconds. Um, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I feel like you just go anywhere, right? Whether you're retail, whether you're e-commerce only, I think there's just a possibility to endless, and it's all about who your consumers are and what they want from you because I feel like they need to purchase it so in the end it's all about the consumer really yeah I would definitely second that like the tech is great but it's all kind of shiny but the, at the end of the day you're selling to people so that has to be your priority love it thank you very much for joining me on stage thank you